We'd like to welcome everybody to our part two of the uh, webinar series with our friend Greg Danes titled 23 Ways to Reduce Churn in, in uh, 2023. My name is Dave Blake. I'm the founder and CEO of Client Success. So grateful to be here with you again today uh, and uh, be here with our friend Greg Danes, who is the founder of and CEO of Churn RX. How you doing, Greg? So good. So glad to be back. Thanks, Dave. I know. Two weeks in a row we get to. I missed it I last week. I had something that came up at the last minute I had to rush and do. And so Christy uh, joined in and I was so jealous not to be here with you. So I said, we got to do part two with Greg. And plus, there's just so much good content in your in your report, Greg. Um, maybe for those who uh, maybe th for those who weren't here last week, Greg, do you want to give a quick overview of who you, who you are in your business and how you came up with this idea for this great content? Yeah, so I'm a, a multi-time founder CEO in the SaaS world. Um, became obsessed with what I think is the most interesting problem in business which is how do we keep our customers and how do we make them successful? So that's what I'm all about. TurnRx has been around uh, for seven years. We've been uh, consulting with some of the world's most uh, uh, amazing companies and we have learned an incredible amount. And one of the things that, that happened along the way, because we do a lot of analyses, so that's one of the things you can get us to do is to analyze your churn. We have a unique way of doing it, but the but the kind of accumulated effect is we have this giant database now of customer retention data, mm -hmm. and it's very detailed. and And frankly, it's scratching an itch that I've had forever, which is, I want answers. Right? There's big questions. We've had these debates that that sometimes just rage on forever, unresolved. I want to know why do customers stay and why do they leave. And we've really been looking at some some fascinating uh, questions. And what this report is is sort of the 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 culmination of a huge amount of research we've done on that database. It's now over a million and a half records. It's really fascinating stuff. So what do we know? Well, actually, we found out a few things that are very consistent, and that's what the report has. So. So yeah, hopefully it's of use. It doesn't mean that every single one applies to every company. You'll know if it does, but what it but what these are really is a way to say, do we know anything that consistently works, that 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 every time we test it matters? And the answer is, yeah, we have a bunch of them. So hopefully we'll we'll get into that. It's been fun talking about it. Yeah, we I've known Greg for many years. Just for, for those who don't, the cool thing about Greg is that he knows exactly what what our audience is going through. So most of you on this call are customer success professionals and leaders. Greg ran customer success at several companies. I met him uh, in that. So he knows what you're, you're going through and can relate to it. And he's got a brilliant mind for bringing data together and bringing practical, um, useful, actionable results to the table. So always been a big fan. Greg spoke at our, our CS100 conference. He's the only speaker, this is a fun fact, only speaker that's spoken at every one of our CS100 conferences, I think. Uh, so, uh, CS100 summit. So we're we're uh, that's how, that's how uh, much we like Greg's stuff. And so, those summits are really great. If you haven't been, you need to come. Those are the. It's, <laughs> there's a reason I I want to be there. I think it's the best conference in customer success. Well, thank you. For those here, you're going to hear a, a, a breaking news this morning. We are going to announce it later this week, September 25th through 27th, in in Sundance Resort. Uh, for customer success leaders. So uh, it hasn't been announced publicly uh, until now. And so the, watch for a public announcement coming soon, but we're excited about it. But let's get into this, Greg. Right. 23 ways to reduce churn in, in 2023. I'm gonna pause and I'm gonna stop sharing and let you share your screen. And uh, let's jump in. Let's jump into one, Greg. Maybe if, um, maybe if, uh, last week, I think we talked about number seven, which is targeting uh, imports of targeting large customers. Number 10, identifying um, every customer's results. Uh, number 12, requiring onboarding for every customer's. Number 15, uh, focus on disengaging customers. 16, track time to first results. And 17, stop focusing on satisfaction. So a lot of good stuff. We can go back there, audience. It's up to you. You take us where you want. But maybe let me start out by asking you, um, help, first explain, I think it's really interesting at the beginning of the report, you talk about three types of churn. So let's start there. Let's talk about three types of churn. And then there's one um, section that I want to I, I want to start off on that are related to uh, charging for onboarding. So let's talk yeah. about the three types of churn. Help us understand that. 
Yeah, so, so one of the interesting things about when you study churn, what you find is that customers don't line up in an orderly fashion and let themselves out, right, in a constant flow. When we look at any company, there's a really dominant area where most of their churn happens. So for a lot of companies, it's early. You can kind of see that chart here at the bottom. This is the shape that we see the most often in SaaS, but it's not the only shape. But, it, but what it tells you is that there are actually really just three types of churn. And the important thing to understand is that customers who leave early do so for different reasons than customers who leave much later. If a customer leaves in 90 days, they're definitely leaving for a different reason than a customer who leaves you after four successful years, right? So that's actually really helpful. If we know when the churn occurs, we already have an extremely strong clue as to what's driving it. So early churns driven by the failure of customers to get to those first results, because everything's about results. And well, but if they get to results, do they ever churn? Well, some do, not as many, but some do. And that's because usually we're not following that up with a regular materialization of those results to customers. So they always know what they're getting. And then, well, does anyone churn after that? Yeah, fewer. <laughs> but if they churn after that, it's because they're not growing enough, right? Eventually, they need new value. They need to be able to show new wins. And so when, when we look at churn, we really look at early, which is roughly the first year, Think of it that way. Yeah. Mid, which is sort of the second year, and late, which is after that third, third and on. And we really find that just knowing where the bulk of your churn is really helps you to know what you can do about it. And so when we designed this, what we did was we looked at we looked at um, all of the different things that we know that have come out in the data, right? That have leverage against each of those areas. And you'll notice there's a lot more early churn levers. There's fewer mid churn and there's very few late churn. Well, that's actually a really good way of visualizing how much of what drives churn is in each of these phases, right? There's just a lot more going on in the early stage. Now, early stage churn is really great. And, and it's the churn we want, actually. Why would why would we want churn? Well, yeah, I mean, zero churn is not a serious issue. That's, that's silly. What we're looking for are the... The reason we like early churn is because it's the most addressable. So look, there's there's literally 16 things just in this report, and this isn't even everything you can think of, but that you can do about early churn. So it just shows you just you know how how the thing you're doing, what you're what you're working on to drive down churn, it's going to heavily depend on when that churn occurs, and so that's important kind of as a jumping off point. Yeah, that's great. That's super fascinating. So. I want, to, I want to push on this a little bit. Is there an early, early churn? Yeah, meaning uh, yeah, I've you know once heard and, and shared even myself that churn starts in onboarding. Is there a concept that that a customer could be gone essentially within the first ninety days? Is that? Is oh that yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah. we have customers that are dead on arrival. I mean, have you ever had a customer you could never even get them? to the kickoff. I mean, that happens, right? True. What's going on? How could they, they just decided to buy this and they're already gone. What's going on? Well, it really highlights how important it is to understand what's going on at the early stage of a customer's relationship, yeah. because there are really two big drivers of early churn, right? The first one is bad fit, yeah. bad fit churn. Now, why do we know that's early churn? Well, it doesn't take a customer three years to figure out they're not a good fit for your solution. They, fi they figure it out quickly. In fact, the customers who leave the fastest are almost all dominantly bad fit sales. So, yeah. right, like that was a customer who couldn't win. And then we have those that come in and quickly fail. They run out of steam. They, they lack resources. They lack motivation, whatever. But and those can be really quick, too. Those can those can lead to churn right in onboarding. But but when you look at that first phase and by the way, for most SaaS companies, that's actually where you should be looking. In yeah. most cases, that's where your dominant drivers of churn are. Do you, uh, let's, uh, I actually, I love this, and this is a real pa concept I'm passionate about. So what if we jumped into number one, start with number one? Yeah. Can we go still, to number one? Stop selling yeah. bad to customers. And I think the question is, is it, we're all customer success professionals, or most of us, there, there may be some that, that aren't. But if, if I've got a sales team who are selling to bad fit customers to where we get it. And it's one of those things like, Oh no, no. like, why do we, first of all, explain what bad fit customer means. And then what do we do? What do we do as customer success professionals 
to influence this situation? Any, any suggestions? It's a great there? question. We have to start by being pretty honest with ourselves about what we mean by this, right? Because just because a customer churned doesn't mean they were a bad fit. Other things could have gone wrong, right? Some of which are their fault, some of which are our fault. And so we actually do have to be careful. I define a bad fit customer as a customer who can't win. They don't have what it takes, they don't have the right use case, or they don't have the minimum necessary resources to do this right. Right. So maybe you have a maybe you're a business support service and you and you have a customer who comes in who's just hoping to start a new business. Well, they don't have a business, right? That's not a good fit. They're not they're not there yet. Or they have the wrong use case, et cetera. We have to be careful. So we do want to keep that, we do want to be strict because there are some customers who are a good enough fit that they could win, but then they fail. That doesn't mean they were a bad fit. So we do have to be careful about that. But the second thing then is okay, what do we do about it? I I don't sell, I don't, I'm not in the marketing group, what can I do? And actually, I think that's a really important misunderstanding. We have a very important role to play in this. Like, what's our role? The answer is, actually, sales and marketing will continue to load those customers up as long as it's not made clear to them they can't win. So we have to, we have to go through the disciplined process of identifying what are absolutely the most important elements that have to be in play for a customer to be able to get any results, right? And in order to, to think that through, we've got to really take a hard look at that because there's some things that just might make them likely to fail. That's not bad fit. Can't win is bad fit. So yeah. the first thing we can do is just clearly articulate that. And to be fair, we need data to do that. We need to make sure that when we identify something as a can't win thing, we need to back that up. If we're not pushing that definition clearly up the chain, that's on us right now okay if we've done that and they still sell them you know what's that about well the next thing we can do is to continually identify those customers pull them out as a segment and show their churn rate that's a yeah. very effective way to to close the feedback loop as long as you load up those customers i'm going to keep showing this churn rate and why and why it's you know nearly 100 percent or whatever so that's really p powerful but i think in the process of doing that myself I found that I was having to be more honest with myself about what I really meant by that, right? But that led to some real epiphanies. And one of them is when you identify something that's, that's a risk factor, but not necessarily a bad fit factor, then I can think, well, what could I do about that? You, you could win if you were this kind of customer. Well, what could I help to make that customer win? What could I do that would help just them? Because one of the things I try to teach people is, Divide and conquer is the way you conquer churn. You, you identify specific groups, specific situations, and then you build a solution for that. You don't try to peanut butter all your resources and all your attention across mm -hmm. every stage of every customer. No, look for who's churning and when they're churning and what's driving that and really focus in on that. So the process of defining what bad fit means really led me to be much more clear about what it didn't mean and what I could potentially do about those things. Yeah, no, I love that. I, um, I, I, I'll share an example of ours. When we, we're early in, in the early days of client success and you're trying to just do everything you can to just close deals and get new customers, um, we identified that there was a profile of customers that were not good fit. And our, our VP of sales actually collaborated really well with us to identify that and said, okay, um, we these customers, when we close this profile of customer we don't we have a 100 percent track record of not being able to keep them this was early days this was years and years ago so what we did with the input of that data is created we updated our ideal customer profile and we collaborated with sales to do that we came up with four different um ideal customer profile categories one two three four and we said we're very good about about retaining and closing ICP ones, ideal um, ideal customer profile category one, horrible at ICP four, and decided to make a big decision is that we will never sell to to threes and fours, those that match those profiles we won't sell to because we know we're not a good fit, and at first it was scary because it was like yeah but we're closing them we're getting revenue on the front end. But we're losing them on the back end. And so we had to make that honest decision and say, let's stop targeting, let's stop selling to, and let's actually turn away 
customers that don't meet our ideal customer profile. And it, changed, it made a significant improvement. And yeah. so I, I just for, as a as a as seconding what Greg says, you as customer success leaders, under uh, try to identify those customers that are not just not good with your platform or their customer experience, and and share that back with sales and marketing to to refine your ideal customer profile. And I think it'll help tremendously. So, right. And one more thing, hey, if, you, if, we, if you're involved in a difficult discussion with sales and marketing about that, remind them that every account that they sell that's a bad fit took time away from them selling one that's a good fit. Exactly. And one thing we know, bad fit customers close at a lower rate than good fit customers. That shouldn't yeah. shock anyone. And if you're a salesperson, what you want is to close, close, close. So you're actually doing them a favor saying, hey, look, go here. This is where you're going to win at a high rate. And yep. then you can really get on the same page. Agreed. There's a couple of questions real quick on this. Corey's asking, are there specific characteristics of customer profiles that indicate not a bad fit or does it solely depend on industry? Like, is there any insights about, again, how do, how do you understand what's a good fit or a bad fit? Is it is it mainly just... Um, you know, um, ease of using your platform and, and getting results. Is it, um, is it churn? Any, yeah. any, any final details on that? Well, I think it's really important to understand mechanically how customers get results, right? Yeah. They need to install this, integrate this, have a champion that does this specific job, you know, whatever. List the mechanics of success. What are the minimum requirements to get a very little amount of results out of your system. Those things are all on the list. If they miss something right on there, they're not a good fit. They don't have the right use case, et cetera. So, yeah. so it's not a relative thing, but sometimes it's not obvious what all should be in there. And one thing that I would recommend is the ultimate arbiter of who's a good fit is who stays. So do a, do churn analysis. And, and, and properly spread out the different use cases, properly look at them. So we had a client that, that had a really cool solution that, um, that was developed actually for, this, for the restaurant industry, right? And they were doing really cool stuff. And, that, and it turned out it could be used in a lot of different spaces. So they started selling across spaces. Well, what we, what we found when we did the analysis was that actually nearly every space except restaurants was churning at a super high rate. So it's not that it was inconceivable that they could win. It just wasn't the use case fit wasn't there. And I think, you know, they can go look for how could they expand the product, et cetera. But when you're stuck with the product you have, which in CS we usually are, so let's just own the fact that it doesn't work. So they shifted back to restaurants. They closed at a higher rate, grew faster, and their churn went massively down. So it's sometimes it's just about coming to terms with the fact, hey, guys, this is what we are today. Let's do it really well. Let's dominate that category. And that's actually going to be our best growth trajectory. Yeah, I love it. Uh, for those, Greg's uh, introduced, I think, a, a game changing concept in the past called uh, uh, success analysis, understanding which customers stay and why. Go look at his site about that. But but if, if you can understand that and tell your team, sell more to these customers, our most successful customers, um, and, and this profile of customers, it, it's game changing. Yep. All right, let's let's move on to the, another one. So with that, um, I, I'm going to go to number eight. Number eight is that uh, you're recommending that we should always charge for customer onboarding. Now, this is fascinating to me because I got to be honest with you. Sometimes with I see uh, sales teams where onboarding is non-recurring revenue. And if you're going to discount anything, a lot of times customer onboarding is discounted or given for free because it's non-recurring revenue and companies, SaaS companies tend to optimize for recurring revenue. So yeah. why is that a bad thing? You're saying that that's a bad, you know, potentially a bad thing or a challenge or um, a gap. Why should we charge for, for customer onboarding? Give us the thoughts on there. Well, the simple answer is because it's proven to work better, but let's dive into why, like, what does that have to do with anything? One thing's for sure. SaaS companies don't care about non-recurring revenue. And, and to a certain degree, they shouldn't care about it. It's not how they grow. It's not how they're valued, et cetera. Mm. But there's a problem and it's in uh, the problems in human psychology, actually. It turns out that if you get something for free, you value it for nothing. And uh, unfortunately, onboarding is really important. Depending on how well we're doing it, it's where we give our customers the most valuable expertise we have. And when I use the term expertise, I mean, 
the knowledge of how our customers win. So this comes back to that success analysis thing. Why do some customers win? What are they doing differently than the customers who are failing? Because there's tons of variability, right? We give them the same software, we give them the same services, and yet their results are all over the place. So the issue is, well, why are they succeeding? What do the good customers do that leads to results? Well, that's what we put in onboarding. Now, the problem is, if they don't show up for onboarding, it does, it does them no good and they're not gonna get good results. I really need my customers to show up and pay attention. Now, obviously we need to make our onboarding as valuable and rich in expertise and helping customers change their behavior, but it will be pointless if they don't show up. And it turns out that there's a psychology here called skin in the game. If I think I paid something for onboarding, I'm much more likely to show up and pay attention to see what I could learn from that than if I got it for free. Now you think, well, so does it matter how much how much you pay? Like, where's the threshold, by the way? Where's the threshold in the data? We actually have a ton of data, so we're able to ask, how much is enough that people feel they have skin in the game? Any guesses? What's your guess, Dave? How much to pay to have skin yeah. in the game? Two yeah, before it, before it's significant. 2,500, I don't know, 5,000? I get answers all over the place. Yeah. You're not gonna believe the answer, it's $1. Really? Isn't this crazy? So, so what's the point? Does that mean we should all charge $1 for our onboarding? No. What it proves though in the data is that this is a psychological impact. Therefore, what it proves is whatever you do charge, it doesn't have to be a specific tied to a specific proportion of your ARR or something like that. It doesn't have to make you back the money you spent on onboarding, although that helps. But remember, we don't really care about one-time revenue. So the point is, Price it so that people will buy it. Now, you asked about discounting it. Well, we'll say it's 2,500, but we'll just give it away to you because I want to close the deal right now. Well, don't do that. It, we have data actually that looks at the, the impact of discounting on churn and discounting drives churn. So it's actually, not, it's another one of these. I think it was three or four anyway. The point is stop deep discounting. Well, what about if I have to give a discount, should it be discounting the annual subscription? or a couple months, or should I discount the onboarding? It turns out the impact on customer results in the data is bigger if you discount onboarding than it is if you discount software. So if I have to discount one or the other, and we should stop discounting heavily, up to about 15 or 20% discounting doesn't seem to have a churn effect, but over that it does. So you don't want to discount services. Why? Because you're sending an even more intense message. When I discount software, I'm, sign I'm sending a message that's like, well, you know, it, we're doing this at a mass scale. It's SaaS after all. So, you know, but in the case of human services where you're going to be on learning from our team, that discount sends a weird message like it's not that valuable. Our time is not that valuable. And I think that's, a, I think that has that psychological impact. So you don't want to discount onboarding if you can, and you definitely want to charge something for it. And we see that that really has an impact in the data. Oh, that's great. I'm going to throw, uh, throw, uh, ask you a question just out of the blue. I've nope. heard some people who have said, I'm going to charge up front, but I'm going to give a refund if they are on board by a certain period of time, which is kind of an interesting philosophy I had never heard. So maybe I say, hey, it's $1,000 for onboarding, but if you get it, if you, if onboarding is complete within the first 30 days, we'll give you 500 back or 1,000. Any thoughts about that? It, mm -hmm. Yeah, we've seen that work. It can work. Here's the thing you got to do to make sure it works. Because remember, the principle is skin in the game, and you're getting skin in the game. They know they put money out, which they might be, uh, they might never see again if they don't actually show up and pay attention. So it can actually be very motivating. And the the one thing you got to do though in that case is you can't be insincere about their about what they're committing to. So you have to be very clear. Here's what onboarding is. It's four sessions. You have to show up to all four sessions within 90 days or, you know, or we're not going to get you where you need to be. All of this is designed to get you customer to the results you want that you care about. So you got to show up to these things. There's a couple of homework things, and then we're going to check at the end to make sure you've checked off our, our checklist. Are you going to commit someone to show up to those and do those things? Yes, we will. Okay. Then I actually think that method works pretty well. That's our experience. Okay, great. And by the way, I don't know if you refund it. Most companies that I've seen do that just apply it to the uh, to the license fee. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. Hey, great. 
All right, let's jump to another one. Um, let's see. I, I like the comments on some of these. Jesse said, um, because you, when you charge, you assign value to something for a customer to find a valuable. And Stacy, you get something for free, you value it for nothing. So that's great. Yep. Um, let's jump on. Let's see. I'm going to look at, at the group. How about, um, let's go to number 10. Identify every customer's results. How do you do this? <laughs> well, I, 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 you're not asking why, but let me just touch on why first. Yeah. This is the most predictive factor we found, no matter what we've tested. We've tested literally hundreds of things, Dave, yeah. and millions of records. And, you know, uh, it's a different number, but, but you find out later that one of the things we've tested that doesn't predict retention is customer satisfaction, never predicts retention, has absolutely no predictive power. Well, then what does? And the answer is lots of things do, but one is by far the most predictive, and that is whether or not you measure customers' results. This is incredibly powerful. So it's that important. Okay, so that, that should start to be why does it have to be every customer and why is this so important, right? Um, but how do you do that? Okay, so, so it's not inconceivable to anyone listening to this that you could get on a call with a customer and you could talk about what they're trying to achieve and you could write it down and we could agree that's the goal and, and we could get that done. The problem, and by the way, that works. I'm, I've seen lots of versions of that, customer strategy docs, et cetera. I think they work great. I've never seen them not work, but there is a problem. And that is, that's a lot of work. It's hard to do that at scale. How do I make that a standard process that we can do at scale across a large number of customers? So that actually is a challenge. And, and so one of the things that I, I strongly recommend is to, is to standardize it. So one of the things we do with our clients is we'll, we'll say, okay, what are your customers' key results? And they'll frequently come up with a dozen or more. And well, that can't be true right there aren't a, one of the things that we know is when we go and we talk to successful customers they don't give you a dozen answers as to what was most important to them it tends to be one or two things yeah. and so what we do is we start to draft we have a very basic framework where we draft what's the key result how's it measured right how do we know that's a key result and then what would customers have to do to achieve it when you do that 10 times what you discover is that there aren't 12 things there's one yeah. or two or at most three now that you know that you can standardize your outcomes document. I don't have to write it from scratch for each customer. I can say, which of these is most important to you? Let's focus on that. And I wanna be your advocate to get you to that result. I can do that in five minutes. It, it can even be done, Dave, in a tech touch situation, because now we know the three possibilities or two. In yeah. many cases, it's one, by the way. We can confront with a clearly worded email and let the customer interact with that and take them through a sequence. So that this isn't really dependent just on humans. It's dependent on our ability to consolidate clearly what is our benefits model and help customer. Because the other thing is, you know, if I ask a customer, what are you trying to achieve? Nine times out of 10, they'll say, I want to install a client a success system. Exactly. <laughs> Okay, no, that's what we're doing. Why are you doing it? Well, we, you know, we lose a lot of customers. Oh, I see. So you're trying to improve your customer experience and, and, and save more customers. Okay, what, what would that mean to you? Well, that's our main revenue driver. So, so this is about, oh, this is about protecting and growing your revenue. Okay, now I know what this is about. You see, what I did there was a little bit of a, it's just a quick transformation to hop yeah. people from where they're at to where they need to be. And, and one of the things we need to understand is that that's our job. We have to guide them. That's the first piece of expertise we share with customers. Now, some customers know, of course, and that's cool when they come in and we love those customers, but it's the, it's the minority. The vast majority of customers need us to guide them to the right answer. And we can do this quickly and at scale, but only if we've consolidated into a clear articulation of what our benefits model is. And if yours has 10 things, it's not done. It, it, it really comes down to one or two or three. So let me go, if, if you jump over to 18, I think that these are related. So 18 is to measure and show, um, show customer results. So the front end is that we wanna make sure that we identify the results. Uh, and I, as I understand it, you're saying like, with your company and your platform, you identify what are the most common value or benefit factors that you drive. So if I'm a, if I'm a CRM, for example, 
One of it may be that I drive bookings and new revenue or whatever, right? Okay. And so what I should do is standardize on some value, um, value. What, what did you call benefit factors of your platform? And Results, instead, yeah. of asking, instead of going through a process of, of asking every customer, what are they trying to do? You basically steer them to those that you know your platform provides and then demonstrate demonstrate your ability to achieve those results. Am I did I articulate that accurately? Yes, exactly. The vast majority of your customers haven't done what they're doing with you before. If they yeah. had, if they were good at it, they probably wouldn't need you. So let's assume for a moment that one of the things they're not sure yet is exactly how to know when it wins and exactly how that will be measured and materialized in results. Yeah. So Share that with them. Say, look, here are the key results our customers come to get. Now, by the way, if a customer comes along and looks at that and doesn't recognize them at all, what do we know about that customer? <laughs> They're a bad fit. Back to the bad fit thing. This actually helps with that. Yeah. Right? It can't be anything. You can't get any benefit from whatever your application does. So we had a client that was selling relatively diffusely and broadly, as a lot of SaaS companies do right now. And they had a lot of customers coming in who are not a good fit. What they did was to consolidate down to what are the exact results metrics that we use to think about it at the end of the year, what metric do I want on a slide in front of the client that is the compelling spike the football result metric that will ensure they renew? Okay, what do I want? That's, that's got to be at least the number one, right? And there may be two more. I, I, in many cases, there are not. It usually comes down to one or two. So what I need to do is be clear about that. Then at the front end, say, hey, look, our, our best customers achieve really good results in these ways. And here's how they're measured. Does this look familiar? Does this connect to your use case? In many cases, this is the first time your customer will have thought it through in that detail, right? They won't have come with a preconceived notion where they thought in a disciplined way and figured out how it would be measured. They're actually learning right now from you when you do that to them. And you know, it's interesting because our data shows, you, you can kind of see this in here. The data shows that if you measure results for customers and they're terrible, because one thing you might be thinking is, well, I don't want to measure results. A lot of my customers are not getting good results. And do it anyway. Our data shows that if you measure results and show them to them and they're bad, those customers actually still stay twice as long as customers you don't measure for. And they think, why is that? That's strange. Why would they, you've just proven you're not getting results. Why would they not leave you immediately? Well, we've talked to a lot of customers and they say a very interesting thing. They say, well, why would I leave you and go to your competitor who won't even measure my results? What makes me think they're going to do better? Yeah. Say, at least I'm working with a company that's serious about my results, focused on helping me get there. I'm sticking with this horse. It's really interesting. It's a very sophisticated judgment. Customers are more sophisticated sometimes than we realize. But that's why measuring is so, so, so important. So, Greg, I, I totally am on board with this concept. Love it. How many, with your experience, how many companies are actually doing this, though? What? Virtually none. Because we, we talk about it in the customer <laughs> success. We talk about it as, you know, yeah. measuring desired outcomes, goals, objectives, results. But how many really do it? Um, I actually, uh, while we go on to the next one, I agree with you. I'm going to do a quick poll. I did this on the fly. So I'm going to ask yes. this audience. I'm going to ask him how many, how many of you are actually measuring customer results? So let's see if we can, if it did this just jump up, pop up yep. for everybody. Yep. I see okay. it. So I gave a kind of answer mm -hmm. to those that, that may be doing it. But, um, but I think this is game changing. I love the way, I think the reason why Greg and I love the way you've done it is it's hard because yeah. sometimes customers can't even articulate effectively what they want to, um, what they want to achieve. And so right. I think being able to standardize it for your product and coach uh, uh, customers to, into more of a standardized uh, framework can be, can be game changing. And then being able to share those back with the customers can even be that much more um, uh, game changing. So yeah, totally. Okay. Um, we are, I'm going to show the results. Thank you for all. We've had 55 who have answered it and the answers. Does it share? Here's the results. Yes. Can you mm -hmm. see the results, everybody? Yeah. 31%. Yes. Mm -hmm. so kudos to the 31%. Yeah. I'm, I'm, um, I'm doing it. 13 say no. And 25 says kind of. So um, yeah. very interesting. 
uh, results. And I think Greg's given us a really good idea to consider doing it so that it can be consistent across the board. So um, yeah, and 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 one thing I would point out, and this may be the kind of group which is which is interesting. I've been here many times. It's well, we identify them. We even probably wrote them down, and then at the end of a period or even maybe at checkpoints along, we ask the customer if they're getting them. You see, that's actually not what I'm saying. I'm not saying yeah. see, ask the customer if they get results because that presumes something I have not found to be true, which is that most customers are even capable of measuring the results that matter most to them. So what I'm recommending is that you take ownership of it directly. You figure out how to measure it for them. Now, people say, gosh, a lot of these are hard to measure. Yeah, exactly. And, it, and it's precisely that is the reason why it's such a great opportunity. If it's hard for you to measure, it's hard for them to measure. And like I said, just measuring is a value add. So, you know, I had this client that said, well, I, don't, I can't measure the thing that matters most, right? I have this team, the, the result I want is that I'm trying to get my engineering team morale improved. That's what this whole point, I bought new tools to improve morale. So I can't measure that. And I said, yes, you can. I'm gonna call you every month and you're gonna give me a thumbs up, thumbs sideways or thumbs down on morale. And I'm going to put it in a Google sheet and we're going to look at it at the end of the year. And of course, the thumbs up got better and better over the year. She took that to her boss. They all considered it a win. Now, why would they take that seriously? That's such subjective data because there's nothing better. Don't forget that better than nothing is still at a very important standard of value in the world. And so if it does, there's no metric that can't be measured. They're just the ones we're not measuring. So I really recommend find a good proxy, find something your customer will, will accept, and then systematically measure it. It is incredibly, I mean, hopefully you can see just from this chart, it is incredibly impactful on long-term retention. This is the most impactful thing customer success teams do to have exceptionally high retention. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Let's <laughs> jump on. Should we jump on to another one? Yeah. Um, how about number 19? Next one, track oh. lead risk indicators. Um, give us give us the insight here. How do we do this? Why? What's you know? Let's jump into there. So the problem is, have you ever rescued a customer? Right. So we've all done customer rescues, and one of the things we know is they mostly fail, right? But then sometimes they win, and we're all high fiving. We saved the customer. They renewed. But you've ever have you ever had that sneaking feeling after you did the high fiving? that maybe they weren't as rescued as you think. Well, we <laughs> tested that. And what we found was the customers who'd been through a rescue were significantly more likely to churn in the next round. In fact, most of them churn out over the next two rounds. So the truth is we haven't really rescued them. Yeah, I don't think, I'm gonna make a, a bold statement. I don't think you can rescue customers. So that means the only way to save customers is to prevent them from getting into that situation in the first place. And the issue is it takes time to fix it, right? Whatever the problem is, it takes time. And most of the time it's because it has to do with them changing some behavior and then, and then doing the things that lead to good results, then seeing results show up in their metrics, et cetera. So I need time. The reason leading indicators, so, so this is the problem. Most of our risk indicators that we operate on are lagging. Some of them are useless, like customer satisfaction, but some of them are great. They're just lagging, like utilization. If a customer stops using the product, yeah, that's a good risk factor. It's just too late, right? Yeah. They've already failed. So I need leading indicators. I need to know the customer is going to fail before they know they're going to fail. That way I have plenty of time. I have their engagement and their willingness, which is a critical ingredient in getting you know things turned around. So I need leading indicators. So these are leading indicators, obviously fit. That one goes without saying. But are they even engaged? If they're not engaged, they're going to fail. It doesn't matter if they don't think they're going to fail. If they haven't noticed it yet, we know they will, right? If they're not changing behaviors, these are the things, the, the few things we isolate that say, look, these are the things customers who get good results do. It's one step one, step two, step three, whatever that is. If they're not doing those, they're going to fail. And they may not know it. In fact, they may be at that point just really chuffed and excited. This thing's great. But I know if they're not doing those things, I know they're going to fail. So I'm going to intervene then. That's the moment to intervene. So this is one of the things. You have to track these. Most of these don't come out easily out of a system. Fit, engagement, behavior, their results. We're going to have to go create fields in our CRM or in our client success system where we track these things. If there are three behaviors, make three fields. Did they do the first one? Yep, here's the date they did it. 
Now, I know that's work. This is super annoying, but think about it. This gives you an incredible superpower, which is the ability to see the future. I don't have to wait till someone's red. I know they're red when they think they're green, <laughs> right? And that means I can go and I can intervene now when it's easy and likely to succeed. Anyway, that's the idea of leading at risk indicators. So wait, Greg, are you saying that a sophisticated AI driven health score is not going to capture all this stuff? Yeah. Uh, the problem with the problem with health scores, they're generally useless, even if they're very predictive, simply because they're lagging. It's too late by the time that the red light goes on. I know you're being facetious, but yes. by the time the red light goes on, you know, the problem with AI, actually, it's a, it's a little worse because AI tunes itself. It tunes its own machine learning, tunes its own model to what's most predictive. Well, you know, what's most predictive, whatever's the most concurrent with the churn itself, meaning the least uh, time advantage, the, the, the least far in advance of that failure. So we actually do have to take ownership of this. And, and look, these things don't happen in nature. I have to take, a, 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 I have to make a deliberate act to say, did they do this behavior or not? And then if they didn't, or by a certain time, that puts them on a list where we can actually go intervene. And by the way, that's the most powerful red account process there is, is to know way in advance. If I, you know, <laughs> I like to say the, the cardinal sin in customer success isn't churn, it's unexpected churn. Yeah. It's when you didn't know. Yeah. And because we should know. That and so I say you can't prevent churn if you don't predict it. We have to be good at predicting it as far in advance as possible. Yeah. And and right reason I asked that is I've I've been a customer success leader myself before founding this company and, and I'm a big believer in data driven insights around health. So health score, data driven health scores, AI, all those with human insights mm -hmm. that is not sometimes measured, measurable directly from data. Um, and the combination of the two is like you're saying here, there's certainly data driven, but there's some aspects of it that we have to glean through interaction and, and human judgment. The combination of the two is the best uh, indicators of, of health um, because totally. either, either one can give you a false positives or false negatives uh, from my own experience. Absolutely right, so, yeah. totally right. Um, all right, we've got about 10 minutes. Let's jump into some more questions. These are so good. I, I, okay. I want to I wanna take, and I know I don't know how many were here, but the, the loved one is track time to first results. Maybe just a, a quick one, time to first results. Is that, if we go there, it's number 16. I know you talked about, we talked about it last week, but maybe just touch on that again. Is that the same thing as time to first value? And is there a yeah. difference? Is there yeah. any difference of, time to onboard or go live is that worth measuring versus time to first results which is which the go live isn't necessarily a result right Can no go live is a step a toward a result yeah. yeah and the reason we use by the way value is a great concept it's the right concept i have no problem with the concept but i don't use the word and the reason i don't use the word is it's become squishy yeah so if i say well value you know it's whatever the customer thinks it is no it isn't yeah. A year from now, when their boss says budgets are cut, prove to me we should keep this thing. Value won't matter. Measured results will matter. Yeah. So I do want to be careful. It's the right idea, but I just don't use that word anymore because we need yeah. to be very hardened about it. Okay, but to your point, you should measure both those things. I should measure the time it takes to get uh, to, to implementation, to live. I should measure that because time is not our friend. The longer it takes, the more likely they are to lose heart and give up. That's just a fact. So yeah. we do have to be good about that. But that's not the result they're looking for. That's not the thing they can take to the bank to prove this whole thing was worth all the trouble and money. That's a result. And so it is different than getting live. They both matter. Um, in some ways, getting live matters simply because it's probably a gating factor to getting to results. So for sure, you want to do that. But yeah. when what we found in the data is when a customer gets to their first result. So we had a customer who was like in the marketing space and it was like email marketing solution, right? And what we found was that, you know, people would come in with a goal of selling a million more dollars this year than they did last year on email. Fair enough. But do you know when they decided the, the project was a success? Was when they made their first dollar on the yeah. new system. No, yeah. that's not success. That, I mean, they said it was a million dollars. But no, people are more sophisticated. They're looking at it. And what they're looking for is evidence this is going to work. 
And so it's actually that first result that's the biggest turning point in any project. And you wanna to get to that as quickly as possible. So what we did was we redefined their onboarding process. So instead of setting up all this stuff, configuring stuff, running A-B tests, we said, send your first sales email with the solution. Within 24 hours, send your first one. And then we're gonna track and see who bought from that. And the first dollar, we're gonna celebrate that. When we did that, their churn went massively down because yeah. they were getting much more quickly with less effort and trouble and friction to that first materialization that this is actually going to work. It's, very, it's a very profound moment. That's the most important moment in the entire customer journey that we found as an inflection point for, for churn. Yeah, I love it. And I, I always say that, that, that one is that results, you don't need to complete on, full onboarding to sometimes to get results. There's, a, there's an aspect in our platform where um, somebody mentioned up there, we have a Pulse feature. As soon as people configure that and just start using that, that's um, they're getting some value, some results, yep. right? Yep. Um, so results totally. necessarily don't always correlate to uh, um, having onboarding all the way complete. Sometimes products can get results early. Um, and the second one is just that um, uh, effort does not necessarily always correlate with results. Yeah. Um, as you said, something could be very simple to do or use in your platform or in your solution that could give massive results. Um, it, it, there's not necessarily always a direct correlation between effort and results. So That's absolutely right. And what we, we wanna do, take a look at your onboarding and say how much of this stuff is unnecessarily delaying when they get to their first result and take all that stuff and move it somewhere else either put it after the first result right or put it in a template why are we doing all this admin configuration just say we've set it up the way most customers want it let's get to sending your first email and making your first dollar you know push that off because all of that's friction that's going to make some customers fail so you absolutely want to re-streamline it around what's the shortest route from kickoff to first measured result. Awesome, awesome. All right, uh, we are, we've are we got about five more minutes. Let's take a couple more questions. If you have questions on any of this, drop them in Q&A. Um, uh, one question from Jesse that's just general is like, what are you seeing right now with the market pressures? Um, the the eco economic headwinds at the moment with a lot of companies feeling um, uh, more churn. Um, uh, we've we've seen that across the across the SaaS space. A lot of people where you you start to see people who are cutting headcount, and before they cut headcount, they want to they cut solutions and systems. But Greg, any any insights that you're seeing out there as far as uh, churn related economic pressures currently? Yeah, I mean, there's no magic bullet. These are brutal pressures. Now, Dave and I are both old enough to have been through a few of these cycles, and there's okay. a lot of scar tissue from it. So then, what's the answer? It, the answer is. The only consistent, reliable bulwark you have in times like this is to have measurable results to show for every case. So when they go to cut your system, they know and they're confronted by the fact that those are results they're walking away from. They will not have those anymore, right? And is that perfect? No, it's not perfect. It's the best thing we have though, and it's pretty good. And in fact, one thing we're seeing in our data, because we, we can track this, um, how much worse has churn gotten it was sort of uh, first over the pandemic and now in this more uh, economic macroeconomic downturn? The answer is not as much worse as you'd think, actually. Sales has been crushed. Sales yeah. is way off. It's, it's a disaster. Yeah. And, you know, because of the way we generally measure churn as a rate over over total, it actually makes the churn rate spike, but be careful about that. There's a more accurate way to measure that. If you want to know what it is, just, just reach out to me. But we use what we call cohort survival analysis to remove that growth effect. And what we're finding in that case is churn's gotten worse, but more or less at the same rate it was getting worse before the pandemic. So I can't say that that alone is a main factor, but if you want to shore up your position for any customers Right. So I, 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 when I was a kid, I went to the dentist and he had a poster that said, you don't have to floss all your teeth, just the ones you want to keep. <laughs> so, so this is my statement. You don't have to track all your customer results, just the ones you want to keep. That's, okay. that's, that's your insurance. And, and it's not perfect, but I'll tell you, it's enough that it's holding a lot of companies steady during this tough time. That's awesome. Well, that's a quote we got to end on. Um, so <laughs> 
Thanks everybody uh, for joining us today, Greg. We're so grateful as, as usual to to have you here. Just some awesome insights through your white paper. Maybe give give insights about how they can find you and yeah. how they can find the white paper. Yeah, find me online. Um, our website is churnrx.com. And I did post the link in the chat, so you can go grab that. You can find the paper there. You can also find out a lot about how we, what we do, which is basically we properly measure your churn and show you how to crush it uh, over time. And we work great with companies like Client Success, who we think are phenomenal for, for everything. And then also, if you want to join my newsletter, it's just gregdanes.com. And, and for sure, follow me on LinkedIn as well. Awesome. Well, thank you, Greg. Uh, thanks for everybody being here. We're, we're grateful every week to have, have you here for our webinar series. This is the first of our uh, summer webinar series. Uh, we are moving back to Tuesday, so we'll have one next Tuesday. Watch for, for the emails coming from Client Success of how to register for those. If you like these, please share with all your friends and have them join us. Should be every Tuesday, Christy and I will be hosting excellent customer success and uh, SaaS thought leaders like Greg Danes throughout the summer. We'd love to have you. And if we can help as a, as a team at Client Success with any of your needs, um, whether it be um, help or our solution, please reach out to us. But uh, thanks again for joining us today. We hope to see you throughout the summer. And thanks again for being here, Greg.